Good evening. In a socially distanced world, Design United is an optimistic digital platform for collaborative design and connection. Welcome to Design United's 10th Design Conversation in conversation with Nashra Balgamwala from Pakistan, joining us from Cambridge, Massachusetts, and Conchita Blanco and Avalon Carpenter from Blanco Studio and Kalpataru, joining us from Bali. I'm Varna Shashidar, founder principal of a regional landscape practice, VSLA, based in Bengaluru. I'm supported by Clayworks Spaces, which creates flexible co-work spaces that focuses on productivity and sustainability. I'm also supported by our enthusiastic Design United core and editorial teams in this endeavor. The main aim behind Design United is to create an optimistic plat platform, a space for regional dialogue, connections, collaborations, and opportunities for young designers and design practices. A much needed network of support and peer mentorship during these uncertain times. The selected designers and design studios we've had are working on innovative design and approaches. They also have a deep resonance with the place they are from, and they genuinely believe in contributing to the environment and the community. We have had in the past wonderful designers and moderators from the region who have joined us in our past conversations. We've had emergent studios like Bogar Studio and Studio Made, Arnai Studio, Be Polite, Compartment S4, Three Flaneurs, architect Avinash Ankalge from India. We also had Herbs, a, planning, a participatory planning studio from Mumbai, Kavan Balasurya from Sri Lanka, and Studio Neba Kalpa World from Nepal. We've had theorists and architects Vaishnavi Shukri, Ishita Shah join us. We've also had Studio Unbuild Mumbai and Eugene Koskaron from Singapore. We will be starting a new mentorship segment to design conversation next Saturday, 27th June, with experienced architects Nisha Matthew Ghosh and architect Min Wee from Sarawak, Malaysia, joining us in this session. This session will be moderated by two young designers, Vaishali from Bangalore and Jonathan from Colombo. We also have a new segment coming up in early July called In Progress, featuring new practices with projects that are in pro progress, discussing their work and their approach. The first will be started by Harshit Nayak and Priyanka, joined by Arjun Ravi from State of Mind on July 5th. So please continue to join us every week on Saturdays at the same time, 4.30 for this conversation. With this background to Design United and upcoming series of lectures, let's move on to the much anticipated presentation and conversation this week. I'm really delighted to welcome our presenting designers for the evening. Conchita Blanco from Blanco Studio, Avalon Carpenter from Kalpataru, and Nashra Balgamwala joining us. Their presentation will be followed by a moderated discussion. So please do type in audience questions for our designers, which will be answered in the discussion that will follow the presentation. I'm really delighted to introduce um, the designers for the day. Starting the talk today are Conchita Blanco and Avalon Carpenter. Conchita and Avalon are both partners in both business and life and founders of their companies Kalpaturu, a furniture design studio, and Blanco Studio, which are both based in Bali. Conchita studied architecture at the University of Melbourne and has worked with renowned Indonesian designer Andra Martin in Jakarta prior to starting her recent independent practice. 
She was a part of Andra's team that put together the brilliant exhibit, Elevation, that explored elevational diversity in Indonesian, Indonesia's vernacular architecture at the sixth Venice, 16th Venice Biennale. Exploring this interest in the vernacular with her own practice, Conchita and her husband Avalon use architecture, art, and furniture as a medium to make change. They share complementary skills in design and construction and are collaborating and working together on multiple projects using time-honored techniques, modern design, and cutting-edge machinery. Their mission is to showcase the lineage and crafts of local artisans of Indonesia, the carpenter, weaver, carver, and smith. We're so happy to finally have you both on Design Conversation, Conchita and Avalon. Welcome to you both. Our second speaker in the session is Nashra Balgamwala. Nashra is an experiential designer working at the intersection of art and politics. She is from Pakistan and is currently a graduate student at the Graduate School of Design, Harvard University, where she's both a leadership fellow and on the Dean's Merits and also a Dean's Merit Scholar. Nashra's work involves the critical exploration of taboo subjects and transforming controversial ideas into games, designs, and experiences. Nashra has been recognized as Forbes 30 Under 30, Fortune's World's Most Powerful Women, and NBC's A to Z list of individuals redefining Asian American stereotypes. Her work has been published globally by BBC, MIT Press, The Guardian, and several other notable media. Thank you, Vaishnavi, for connecting us, and welcome to Design United, Nashra. We will be starting this discussion with Conchita and Avalon. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Hi, could you, uh, Avalon, could you start sharing your screen, please? Let me just, sorry. Uh, second. You can see that. Is that okay? Yeah, we can see that. Yeah. Right. So, firstly, I'd like to um, thank Varna and the whole team from Design United for inviting us to present our work today and to touch on the topic craftsmanship in Bali. So, I'm Conchita, and thank you. I think Varna has done a really great job in introducing the both of us. And so for this uh, presentation, we'll first start with presenting our work from Kalpataru, founded by my husband, Avalon. And then onwards, we'll also present the work and design process from my architectural interior, st and interior studio that I started early this year. So my name's Avalon and I grew up in Bali and I'm an actual carpenter like my name suggests. My father is, a, is an art historian and my mother is a sculptor. I went to an international school here in Bali until my parents decided to send me off to boarding school in Perth and eventually university there too. I start, started Kalpataru in 2007. The name is Hindu Sanskrit and means the tree of life which grants all wishes. Today, Kalpataru is a designer and manufacturer of high-end custom furniture, furnishings and artworks. Using sustainable materials, our artisans engage with both cutting edge machinery time-honored techniques to fabricate distinct creations. We started off as only a manufacturer of other people's designs, but Conchita joined our team in 2013 and helped me to transform our company to what it is today, being our, sorry, being our lead designer and creative director. At Kalpataru, we provide the following services, furniture design, custom manufacturing, art consultancy, and antique restoration. This talk is about our passion in continuing Indonesian craftsmanship into the future, and there is no better place than to start than the artisan. Today, like so many places all over the world, craftsmanship is dying out. What used to be multi-generational skills, such as sword making, weaving, or carving, is being replaced with jobs in, hospi in the hospitality industry. 
hotel clerks, and drivers. And another big culprit in creating this loss of heritage is the market of mass-produced decor, making things as fast and as cheaply as possible. Our focus has always been to work in a symbiotic relationship with Indonesia's talented artisans. Our goal is to mirror the excellent excellence of the great makers of the past, but in a modern context. We look to tell the story of these makers and challenge them with designs that are relevant in this modern time. In doing so, our belief is we can create an economy and opportunity, paying wages that exceed those of others and restore a sense of pride in the role of craftspeople in society. So sustainably sourced materials. At Kalpataru, our material of choice is reclaimed teak wood. However, we work with a wide range of options, including metals, as well as textiles and natural rattan, amongst many, many more. To us, materials are the source of our design inspirations, and we always look to use material materiality as the foundation. Now we'd like to share a few of our favorite projects. Indonesia Now. For this project, we were approached by Potato Head Bali, the island's most successful beach club and hotel group, with an opportunity to help showcase craftsmanship in Indonesia today. The design brief was simple, something for people made using sustainable materials, something modern, but made by hand. Somehow we managed to make something quite complicated, but that's kind of the result of having big ideas and fitting them into a tiny little design the Mata Puzzle Box. This event was aimed to preserve and showcase contemporary uh, Indonesian design. The nominated participants varied from artist, architect, artists, architects, homeware companies, jewelry brands, fashion uh, designers, and, uh, and uh, furniture um, designers as well. So, the, the Mata Puzzle Box was one of my favorite projects that I did for Kapataru. And for this project, at the start, it was it was clear to us that we wanted to try to utilize a lot of the off-cut teak wood. That's mostly at one centimeter thickness, which had we which we had so much of, and clearly we couldn't possibly turn that into furniture due to its sizes. And so we collected the modules that were available to us, which were mostly approximately 25 centimeters in width and in varying lengths. And then we also realized that we have so much of the copper and brass offcuts from our silversmith. And so we wanted to use these materials. We knew that these were the materials that we're gonna work on for this project. And then in responding to the design brief and reflecting upon my Indonesian heritage, I wanted to look back into the traditional objects that were once deemed important to our culture and was part of the lifestyle. One object that caught my attention in particular was the Kinangan box from Southern Sumatra. Both commoners and aristocrats back then would have the box in their home. The box was designed with a secret lower compartment, which was quite um, interesting for me how it was designed. It was used to uh, store precious valuables that is hidden with a single tray, as you can see from the image, that slides through. And at the top of the compartment is basically where they would store chewing beetle quids. And these the, the beetle quids are a ritual offering to the guests and are also chewed uh, themselves for pleasure. And then based on this idea, I decided to create the puzzle box from which the users can keep their valuables. And so I wanted to apply the same concept of this hidden compartment using the tray into the box, but creating a more complex journey, finding the treasure from the box. The whole exterior of the design of the box is completely simplified. And so the main focus is within the interior of the box. I wanted to add the element of surprise. When one tries to open the box, they would go through a five-step journey when revealing the treasure. And so first opening the box, there's a hidden brass pin that locks the box underneath. And then opening the box, you would slide the box open both sideways. And then once you open the box, you're able to basically remove the top uh, storage tray. And then from there, you can also unlock the tray by pulling the rounded wooden button, which then helps to release the copper tray. And there you'll find your treasure. And then shortly after this, we'll show you a quick video of the box, but 
for me, what made the box so unique was not just the design and things like that, but it was the fact that every element and part of the box was made by hand of our talented artisans at Kalpataru. From the brass pins, from the hardware, each wooden carbon, we felt that it was so important to do, though it was a lot more time consuming, but it gives the box more character. When it's handmade, you have these small imperfections that makes each boxes feel different but has a story but more importantly we wanted to preserve and celebrate the old technique that way we can continue the craftsmanship into the future so here's a little video that shows making oops that shows making the box <laughs> So in this video, you can see the clash of modern machinery and hand tools that are as old as time. You get a glimpse at the complicated processes and attention, attention to detail when making. At Kalpataru, we don't look to replicate the creations of the past, but rather to push these heritage techniques into the future through design that responds to a contemporary context. We hope to continue to push these boundaries and to play a part in encouraging and reinvigoration in re reinvigorating the preservation of this for many generations to come. Here are a few items and designs by us to give you an, a little bit of an idea of our works. You can also see a lot more of our completed projects on our website and our Instagram account. And so moving on to uh, my work in Blanca Studio, I guess so. Early this year in 2020, I decided to start my own architectural studio in hope in expanding the platform on what we do in Kalpataru actually into architecture. And so to able to create design that is also of like my own design beliefs and aesthetic instead of a lot more of like um, client driven. One of the projects I will be presenting today for my studio is Kubutaru. I'd like to um, present the design process for Kubutaru that is currently under construction. Um, firstly, we'll start with talking about the context, which is the utmost, most crucial step of design. So first, understanding the site. The site is situated overlooking a magnificent view of the rice terrace, but it is also situated offset down a lane from a busy road. I think to talk a little bit about the climb is also important, as that's also part of the context. Um, so the, the brief was a house, actually the house for a family of four. The client is a textile designer and also owns a beautiful indigo studio up in the mountains. The client both values minimalist living and Zen design, but more interestingly is that the client have a collection of these magnificent solid teak wood columns at 25 or 25 centimeters. So we knew from the start, we wanted to do something about that and use that into part of the design. And responding to the context, the rice terraces becomes one of the main inspiration for the landscape. We wanted to continue the grass terraces into the landscape of the house, thus 
allowing the house to appear in harmony with its surrounding. The local river stones that are also readily available was also something that I wanted to use within, uh, becomes another unique material that I wanted to use within design. And so for the main material of the house, it was clear we wanted to keep a strong monochromatic aesthetic look. And so keeping the design clean. And in the end, we decided upon two materials that represents old and new, teak wood and aluminum metal roofing with a touch of the local linen for the interior that will be made by the client as the client is a textile designer. And so from the start, the client knew what it wanted. They wanted to have a courtyard house basically because they love to be close in nature. And so I designed the house with a courtyard in the middle and encircling the courtyard is the main corridor that's open air, but also acts as the main circulation path into all the other spaces. So the boundaries between nature and the build is kind of one into this house. And then in responding to the context again, I decided to also situate it and sunk the house two meters below the road. That way it helps to reduce the busy sound from the road. And then encircling the house are the grass terraces like landscape, thus tucking in the house in the middle and creating an even more privacy while creating this natural boundary instead of gates. The house floats above water and the land and this way it creates the opportunity for landscape to strive underneath while also allowing for easy maintenance access. A good ventilation, a good air ventilation is also important. And so in achieving that, I designed the house where the roof of the house and the main house is designed separately and detached. And that way it allows for air to travel in in all direction. And so here I'm gonna to touch on a little bit about the roof design. So the roof design uh, responds to the sunlight direction. I took, so basically I took the traditional form of the roof design, as you can see, and then I decided to adjust the roof line to allow for the desired sunlight direction into the house. And that way it helps to cool down the house by controlling the amount of shade that comes in into the space. And then from here is just a sun diagram to show the result from the roof design. And so here the sunlight um, in the morning would peek in through from the east, but during the hot midday sun is completely shaded. But then at sunset, it allows for beautiful orange hue sunlight to peek through the bedroom at sunset. And then here is an isometric drawings to, I guess, communicate the layers of the house, the idea of the construction of the house. So the idea is that um, the roof and the house are built into separate foundation. Here the roof stands on its own wooden columns, while the house floats underneath it with its own foundation underneath, completely detached from the roof. The idea is that once the roof is built, then the woodworking of the house then commences after. And by already having a roof over it, it helps in creating the comfortable environment for carpenters to come in and start the woodworking of the house. So it helps in sequencing the construction phase. And then now I'll take you through a journey through the house design. And so first you enter the house through a series of steps made of stones and brass terraces. And then once you enter the house, you'll be able to right away see through the view. And here is just the scenes around the courtyard. In the bedrooms. And then the living room is sunken down, which then allows for one who stands at the dining uh, room will be able to have a clear view through towards the view while but then when you're also sitting down at the living room, you have a clear wide space of view. As you can see, there's not really very much furniture here. I intended for the house to be built with uh, inbuilt furniture. And then you can see um, the house here. It is intended to appear as if it floats above water and ground. And so that way it also allows for nature to flourish underneath. So here the house, um, 
The house will, will be built by our artisans from Kalpataru. And for this project at the moment, we're in the phase where we're exploring multiple traditional wooden joiner system to apply this into the wooden house. And these are just some of the wooden joiner that we've been exploring and playing around with. And so in the end here, our goal from this house is to be able to showcase the possibility to create designs that takes in mind the role of the local artisans. Because the success of this project at the end of the day is not just because of the design, but it's dependent over the beauty of the woodworking. Um, and in continuing craftsmanship into the future, the, I feel like it is utmost important for design to respond to its context as only in that way is that we're able to create objects or anything that will last and withstand the test of time. Thank you. Thank you, Conchita and Avalon, for melding the artisanal and everyday in your work. We will now be moving on to the presentation by Nashra. All right, so I'll start off with a little introduction to myself. Um, I'm essentially extremely playful, very silly and childlike. And that's one side of my personality that's always playing around. Yet the other side of my personality growing up in Pakistan, as many of you South Asians may have heard, Lokya Kahenge constantly. Um, for the audience that doesn't speak Hindi or Urdu, that means what will people say? And our lives are essentially, especially as females, defined by that. Um, and so there's always been kind of this internal struggle of how to balance the two. So from that came a board game called Arranged, merging together the, you know, the social justice side of things and the playful side. Growing up, some of my closest friends were put in situations where they were married off in, in less than ideal situations. One was married to a man who was gay and didn't know until about a year and a half into the, into the wedding. Um, another one got married three times before the age of 24. And it was just that every time her parents would get her married off to somebody who was less than ideal for her, each time she got divorced, they'd get her married to the next rishta or proposal that came along. And um, one of my closest friends in life, this one affects me the most, um, was the first day she was approached by a matchmaker was the day of her father's funeral. And the matchmaker thought that, that, that because she didn't have a father, she would need a husband to take care of her. So I was obviously very sad for them, but I was terrified for myself as well. And then some auntie came up to me and said, you're 22 and still single. She couldn't believe that I didn't want to get married anytime soon either. And essentially what I started doing was try to make myself feel be less appealing in Pakistan. So I cut my hair short. I got fake tan. I used like bronzing powder to put it all over my face or even just like make fake tan lines so that um, it looks like I was wearing revealing clothes out in public and it's un-Islamic. Or this ring right here. Um, I've been wearing it since I was 18. And anytime I saw an auntie approach, it would just switch to like my ring finger. So kept doing it. It essentially became a bit of a game in my mind. So I decided to make an actual game out of it. Um, I started off by creating this list of all the ridiculous things that I had done, what my cousins had done, what we wish we'd done. Um, and, and I was like, my life has been a struggle to run away from the Rishta auntie. Let this game be exactly that. So essentially, there is this like matchmaker woman, busybody, like up in your business, like, you know, um, chasing these teenage girls with a fleet of men that she has behind them. And the girls are essentially running away by doing scandalous things like exactly what I would do or being seen in the contraceptive aisle of a pharmacy or, you know, carrying a lingerie bag or um, so that's essentially the girls are running away. But the auntie is moving closer to them as she learns about things that they do. Again, very reminiscent of South Asian culture, like she finds out that they can make a perfectly gold roti or um, they use fair and lovely cream or, you know, any anything that is very shallow but considered appealing in South Asian culture. 
So for me, this was essentially a way to educate more of a Western audience as well um, about the nuances between what arranged marriages are versus forced marriages. Because generally what is shown in the media is very much stories of forced marriages, of acid attacks and honor killings. Um, and I kind of wanted to change that narrative and provide an inside like honest perspective. But at the other hand, on the other side, I also wanted to like empower women to actually have a conversation with their families. Cause I think games are a great way of bringing people together and um, having discussions. There is one little twist in the game. There's a golden boy. He's the quote unquote, like desirable boy. So light skinned, light eyed, CEO of a business, doesn't live with his parents. And if he shows up in the game, then the girls switch over to the golden boy deck and start like flaunting their own talents. So then they start speaking about how they make the gold rotis or the perfect cup of chai or how their doctor Dr. Bahu, so essentially a doctor who wants to be a housewife. Um, so, you know, smart, but still will take care of, take care of the household duties. Um, so this is arranged. Uh, and essentially through it, I've managed to get out of an arranged marriage myself, just because now anytime an auntie approaches me, all I have to say is just Google my name and you won't want your son to marry me. Moving on again, I'm a game designer, so keeping in that uh, play side of things, I was very bothered by the um, just everything that was going on in the political world in Pakistan. And I think there could be versions of this game that apply to India, that apply to Trump, that apply to North, like, so, you know, that um, maybe one day I'll work on those. Um, but essentially, Pottering Politicians is a game of moral dilemmas. Um, and I have grown up hearing things from the politicians saying things like corruption is our right, or a degree is a degree, whether fake or real, because technically you have to have graduated from at least high school to run for government. But a lot of those are just, um, yeah, um, forged. Um, so essentially, I created this game of moral dilemmas where the um, players can take one of two routes. Uh, either they can be the hero that Pakistan needs, but it'll be a lot harder for them to win, or they could be the villain and they'll they'll easily win, but will their conscience allow them to do so? Um, and uh, so it has, it's essentially inspired by all real life examples, like most likely to be the leader of a political party, even though he's an exile, most likely to forge documents in Calibri, which essentially the previous prime minister of Pakistan had forged documents in a font that did not exist at the time. And he was impeached because of that. Um, that's how they got him. So the importance of typefaces is also great. Um, and another aspect of this, again, keeping in line with what happens in politics is the ability to rig elections because there's a part of this game where you know people vote or to see whether or not they believe the person's lying or they're actually a morally um, good human being. And But the person who has to tally the votes gets to keep the little ballot box with them for one turn. And if they can sneakily mess around with the votes, they're free to do so as long as they don't get caught. Um, if they do get caught, they have to take a lie detector test. And if they're caught to be lying, the lie detector will give them a little shock. So, you know, a little bit of punishment there, but not, not too terrible. Um, so that's faltering politicians. And then finally, moving on to the last project that I'm going to show right now is uh, Disconnected. It's essentially about Indo-Pak relations and the Kashmir crisis. Um, it came disconnected or connected. Um, so it, it started developing when the Palwama attacks were happening and there were rising tensions between the two countries. Um, one thing I will say is all of my closest friends ever since I've moved to the US have been Indian and Vaishnavi included, the one who introduced me to this group of people here. And, um, and it's just, it's that the minute like Pakistani or Indian expats are put in a space that's not Pakistan or India, they tend to be best friends because they're just naturally attracted to one another, same culture, same language, you know, all of that. Um, the only thing that's always like driving us apart is on the governmental level. And so I essentially wanted this to start as a call for peace, where I felt like everybody would be like, I transformed elements of the flags um, to be peace signs. And I wanted, you know, groups of like, 
Pakistani Indian best friends to be holding them up and start like a Twitter thing that's like make China war. But it didn't feel like the right time. I think people were a little afraid. It was um, so I put this on the back burner for a while and then picked it up again a little while later. Um, and as I was researching and trying to see what form of intervention I could have, I realized that the Indian and Pakistani consulates in New York were on the same block. They were back to back. So I found it ironic and interesting that like even 8,000 miles away, we were still connected in a way, no matter what. Um, and so I, I immediately knew that this was going to be the site for my intervention. And then after a couple of iterations of what was going to happen, I decided to just I decided to essentially get an Indian volunteer with me. I made these uh, peace versions of the flags and we walked around the block constantly holding them. And so our goal was we were wearing red in solidarity with Kashmir. We were always connected in some way or the other. Either we were back to back, we were connected by a little red string or we were somehow like our bodies were touching each other. Um, and so this was one part of the intervention. The second was also taking these um, signs that were there and walking around with those. Um, and then, and finally, just because I like adding a playful aspect to everything I do, um, this felt like it was getting too serious. It was recreating what happens at the Waga border. And that is, um, again, for the uh, audience that isn't South Asian, um, the Waga border is the border between Pakistan and India and every day over there the two guards will uh, the guards on uh, both sides will kind of do a performance at 4 p.m. and um, it's essentially a competition of who can raise their legs higher and they're constantly doing it and it is one of the most entertaining things ever if you aren't aware of it, YouTube it, watch it. It's what I used to watch in college to de-stress all the time. And I kind of just do it in my room all the time. So um, I decided to essentially do uh, uh, my, our own version of it. Um, and it was, it was interesting because like on the Pakistani side, we heard nothing, nobody came out of the consulate, but then on the Indian side, someone did come out and stop us and was like, what are you doing here? Why are you doing it? Um, and our professors had advised us like, uh, like, hey, take some Harvard merch with you and get out of it. So we, we did have, Har like my photographer had a Harvard hat on and eventually we got out of it and they invited us in for chai. So it was, it eventually ended up quite all right. Um, yeah, that's about it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nasha. Uh, I'd like to thank both the speakers, um, Avalon and Conchita, for presenting your beautiful work that combines tradition and taking craft into the future, uh, both uh, through your work at Kalpataru and Blanc. Um, I would also like to thank Nasha for sharing her very interesting work and her non-conformist, very playful approach to everyday taboos and converting it into design. Thank you so much, both of you. Um, we Okay, so I think Ma'am is experiencing a few technical issues. Um, I would like to introduce myself uh, and Vaibhavi, my co-moderator. I am Priyanka Shirke. I am an architecture student from uh, Academy of Architecture. And this is Vaibhavi Pujari. She's also an architecture student from BIT's PVP College of Architecture. And we will be having our moderated session uh, now on. I would like to encourage the audience to kindly uh, post their questions in the question answer box uh, in the tab below and we will be having our question answer session soon. Um, yeah. Uh, I would like to begin by saying uh, thank you to uh, both of y'all for an enriching presentation and it was uh, yeah, and it was inspiring to see how deeply rooted your work is to the place that you both come from, be it Nashra, who is innovatively discussing pressing social issues that are faced through the medium of board games, or Kalpataru and Studio Blanco and trying to uplift the local craftsmanship by bringing in new design ideas, and thus making it relevant and functional in today's context. The first question that we would like to address is that in all fields of design, one undergoes a broadly similar set of processes. In this entire process, from ideation to achieving the final product, 
which stage is uh, which is the stage that fascinates you guys the most should i answer first so sure 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 um i think one of my favorite processes would actually be during the production and manufacture process because starting to see your designs coming to life is really something quite exciting and then you realize that when you start putting things in production and manufacturing there are limitations to you in your designs and there are things that you have to change there are techniques that you have to change and then that's when you start seeing your design or your objects or whatever it is that thing that you're creating to start changing and that you need to be understanding that you need to be um flexible and understanding of the situation but also being quite aware of finding the way out and still achieving the aesthetic that you want to achieve. And I think it's, I love that process the most because sometimes you have this expectation of what it could look like, but then it turns out to be a little bit different, but then that's, that's part of the design process. And that's, what's interesting about it. Nashra? I think for me, it's the beginning of it when I'm figuring out what exactly the game is going to be and what the ideas are behind it mm -hmm. um it's usually when i start making the lists of all the content like a lot of my games are like qualitative content based games so um just collecting all of that data it's usually very amusing to me and i'm just sitting there and laughing to myself half the time um so that's, I do love that part. And then also just figuring out what the game mechanic is going to be and it's interesting because every time I sit down to actually try to make the game and I'm like, what exact, how is it going to function? And I'll be sitting there with my sketchbook for hours and nothing will come to mind. Like everything that comes, I'll scratch it out. And then literally every game I've ever made, the actual uh, mechanism of it has come to my mind while I was in the shower after like six hours of sitting and staring at a book. So that like that aha moment is, yeah. <laughs> uh, hello everyone. First of all, I would like to thank all the speakers. It was a truly amazing presentation. So the first qu the question, is, oh, I would ask, like to ask Nashra first question. So for any game to be successful, it needs to have a great uh, theme and an interesting game mechanism, as you rightfully said. So I would like, to, uh, in your case, I feel that the theme is which it is strong and I believe which comes firsthand. So I would like to know how you uh, decide to a mechanism. like how to have that player experience that you want the experience to exp like feel at the end. So how do you decide on that? So like I mentioned, it's that shower thought that comes, <laughs> but essentially I do, yes, I do start off with, this is the theme that I want to work on and let me like try to, you know, come up with some sort of mechanism and I'll make multiple versions of like, once I have an idea for, I'm like, okay, like, like with the, for example, the Ristanti game, it was, it was very much like my life I spent running away. So this game needs to be about running, right? Like, and that's where the main idea for it came. Again, with yeah. the politicians game, it was like, oh my God, these people are morally corrupt and lying and this and that. I wish there was a way to tell every time like a politician's lying. That's where the lie detector came in. That's where the rigging the elections came in. And then I was like, okay, these are the objects and mechanisms I want. How do I put all of them together in a way that makes sense? And it's never successful in the beginning. Like the the arranged marriage game was super, super boring at the beginning because it was a game of running, but it was like dice and spinning. And there were like just a few like funny cards. And then play testing is like the key to everything. So as I started to play test and realizing, you know, that this, this part of it is not working, then you go back and rework it. And I feel like it's really interesting to note how you have uh, balance perfectly the difficulty levels for all the games while still uh, addressing all these social issues. With uh, Kanjita and Avalon, I would like to ask, uh, buildings of this technological age usually deliberately aim at ageless perfection and they do not incorporate the dimension of time or the unavoidable and mentally significant process of aging that materials undergo. Uh, what are your thoughts about these? Well, we we always like to select materials that will actually become even more beautiful over time like for example the 
when using iron wood and then if you put that within your exterior when it's exposed to sun and rain it starts turning to this beautiful grayish color and that it doesn't need to have a finish and maintenance works over it or even like walls where you can have stop molds going and things like that those imperfections that nature gives to the material oftentimes for me is actually what I desire yeah um to me, it's also a lot to do with the natural patinas that develop over time and embracing that change. Um, uh, you know, for example, my favorite finish is oftentimes uh, on wood is oftentimes an object which is frequently touched over and over again. And uh, for an example, is a sword handle, a wooden sword handle, which will eventually develop this hand, this like oil from the hands and it becomes so smooth over time or a piece of ironwood that's or a piece of wood that's been outside so long that it has this incredible distressed patina that tells the story of the years of sunlight and rain and 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 that that richness of the story it, it can tell it's, it's about choosing the right materials Um, also with Kanjita, I would like to ask, having worked with influential names such as Andrew Martin, how, was, how has that work experience shaped your design philosophy? Um, well, firstly, it was really a joy working um, at Andrew Martin and with him because he's such a, he's a very kind, really inspiring individual. But one, I think, um, yes, he definitely has had um, influence on my designs. But one thing that I've learned so much from working at Andra Martin was I always admire his understanding of scale and that the idea of contrasting elements where like you can't really understand how dark the room is until you've seen the light. You know, you don't understand how, how, how spacious the room feels when, as opposed to when you're in a small space. And that was like an interesting, um, thing to learn from him because for, for him it was really understanding architecture from experiencing the space and that like um and he always likes to create this element of this nodes of surprises through his space when you go through his spaces and i always find that incredibly fascinating and those were i think elements from his design that really stood by me when designing my question is to Nashra. Um, so in today's scenario, we see this transition of digital uh, board games into digital ones. Uh, a prime example would be Ludo, which had gained immense popularity during this COVID situation. What do you? What are your opinions about digitizing games? And do you ever see yourself designing a game, dig digitizing your game? Um, so normally. I am not a lover of digital games or video games. I play none. I don't think I have a single app. I, other than Ludo, I don't have any other game on my uh, phone. And that too was a COVID thing. Um, and uh, so I've never been a big fan of it. But given the world we are in right now and will potentially be in for the foreseeable future, um, I think it has been one of the best mediums. Uh, my friends and I will do Saturday brunch, you know, every week where we play like Scriblio, which is essentially Pictionary or Codenames. And that has been what's like, we're all over the world and that's what's been keeping us together. Um, so yes, I would definitely consider it and see how it would be feasible to do that because this, the world's gonna be digital, so it's needed. True. And uh, since the conversations that you wish to start with these games are deeply entrenched in the South Asian culture and our society, uh, how does the relatability of the issues affect the gameplay? So when you are uh, uh, marketing these games to people not from our uh, backgrounds, how does that affect the whole Interestingly enough, actually, because I get a list of everybody who ever orders my game. Mm -hmm. um, it's, I would say it's 40% South Asian and 60% of the names on there are not South Asian at all. Um, so yeah, it's, and even then, like also the most of the people who, even the South Asians who voted are ones who are living 
in the US, Australia, Canada, rarely are they the ones that actually live in Pakistan and India. So I, I guess because one of the things is that like I did have to tweak it up a little bit for a, a Western audience to understand. And that mm -hmm. was very important. And that's why I did when I was starting off with it, had Western playtesters with me. So I would always like keep one South Asian person and like two or three people from the US. Um, just because there were certain things that they didn't understand. And then I'd be like, okay, how do I tweak it? So it stays true to what the message is, but works even here. Fair. Um, uh, I think we'll have a few questions from the audience for now. And the first question we have is that uh, we have a lot of young architecture student asking us about how they manage, how should you, how would you manage the perils of being in the design field? like being confident about your work or taking criticism. And I feel like this is very relevant because uh, especially with Nashra, you must face like a lot of criticism from the so-called uh, Rishta aunties that exist in our society. So how do you manage? How do you, how do you deal with that? Um, my one thing is never read comments. Never read comments on Facebook and Instagram and all of that. Uh, when my game was released, there were just so many so many shitty comments like oh my god they were heartbreaking and I started to read those and I started to get really down on myself um until luckily I have one amazing friend and he volunteered to read all through every single comment for me and was like I will pick the ones that are actually helpful useful critique and get send those like to you um Again, I made, and it's hard to do that because it's your work and everyone's talking about it and you want to do it. And I, I made the mistake of, again, doing that when I released this Pakistan India project. And there was someone who had commented on it saying, why don't we put these two girls on the line of control? Like, and it's just like, it, it, it's heartbreaking to see it. So I think one of the things that I have to constantly train myself to do is try not to read comments because the internet is filled with trolls. So the next question is for Conchita. Uh, the roof, uh, the roof of the house design you featured has a asymmetric slope. Is the design like a uh, Bali bamboo view, weave, or a uh, or a tile structure? Um. So the the roof design is actually because it is uh, designed detached and separated from the house. The idea was that with the house to have old and new materials. So the roof is actually made of a metal structure within the inside of it. And then um, it will then follow the shape of the roof. And then later on, the metal sheet will eventually be placed and installed on site. Oh, OK. Yeah. Does that answer the question? Yes, I think so. Uh, also with Avalon and Kanchita, you both impacted our societies in extremely distinct ways, uh, especially with your work with the craftsmen. Is there a particular story that has stuck with you that highlights the same? Um, to me, it's sort of, uh, it's, it's not really a specific story, but, but what I feel like is valuable and, you know, something that's, makes me feel proud is is kind of like giving the element of it being cool again to do these types of things like to work on these types of projects i mean we just finished like um a wooden electric motorbike and everybody in my workshop was just going wow what are we working on or or these you know just that sense of like oh, it's cool. And then inviting our staff to somewhere like Potato Head, which was one of our bigger kind of like one of the coolest clubs, just to have them be like, oh, what? Our work is cool enough to be displayed here. Um, and and the other side of it is sort of uh, what what really makes me proud is just seeing, seeing the, you know, the, I mean, the story of being able to provide an economy, you know, showing up at my workshop and seeing a, a bunch of new motorbikes and, and, uh, and, uh, you know, just knowing that my staff can put their kids through school and university and, and, and that, 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 you know, I mean, it's not an individual story, but it's an overall kind of sense of yeah. achievement for us. Uh, so as we come towards the end of the session, and as a parting thought, 
uh, what is the message that you would like to give us to the young designers on having sensitive approaches to the design or the creative process that do they, they go through? I would say, say uh, okay. I would basically say, look up a guy called Dieter Rams. He's got these ten design principles <laughs> that will blow you away. Like really, it's all about honest des design, unobtrusive design. Uh, you know, creating things that that are um, uh, functional but not uh, not pretending to be more than they are. Uh, about choosing sustainable sustainable materials. And the other thing is, you know, if you can design something that is relevant and build something that is strong enough to stand the test of time, I mean, if it lasts twice as long, you have the environmental impact of making that. If you can make something that lasts 50, 100 years or forever, that's really the way to kind of minimize um, the impact of making things and the kind of carbon footprint that you, that you leave behind. Forget about the temporary stuff. It's all about timelessness, I guess. And Nashra? Nashra. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was going to say the main thing for me is not getting attached to your designs and your work because I have done that in the past and then and I'm getting critique and feedback about how it just doesn't work and I'm not willing to let it go. And that's just a waste of your time because eventually you're going to have to let that go if you want to make something that, you know, is successful. So always being open to that critique and um, yeah, there's no such thing as a bad crit, that's, you know. So Avalon and Conchita, your work reflect a great amount of sensibility and sensitivity, supporting traditional craftsmen through involving into furniture design and now taking it further into the architectural studio as well. So Nashra, you, in, you innovatively uh, use this entertaining medium of uh, and, and discuss this pressing social and political issues. So as a young designer, it, it is an inspiring, it is inspiring to see this diverse work we would like uh, we would like to thank you both uh, both for engaging in this conversation today thank you so much amazing work nashra and thank yeah, you yeah you as well loved it and loved you, the design of your presentation too <laughs> thank you thank you conchita avalon nashra for your wonderful presentation and conversation today um thank you uh, to our moderators for the day who i did not get a chance to introduce earlier two young students of architecture from Pune and Mumbai, who are also my colleagues at BSLA, Vaibhavi and Priyanka. Vaibhavi is a sensitive design student from PVP um, School of Architecture, uh, uh, College of Architecture, Pune, who has a deep interest in um, the environment and landscape architecture. And our second moderator, Priyanka Shilke, a fourth year architecture student from Academy of Architecture, Mumbai, who is especially interested in weaving narratives using videography. She's also a member of our uh, Design United core and editorial team. So I'd like to also thank our audience for participating. Have a good evening and see you next week. Priyanka will um, uh, continue with uh, sharing our upcoming series of events. Thank you. Right. Um... I would also like to thank uh, Nasha and Kanchita and Avalon for this wonderful presentation. Uh, Design United as a platform is expanding and now we are featuring two films on landscape. We have a film on transformation through landscape uh, coming soon and we have recently released a film about crafting landscapes on YouTube. So we hope you will like, share and subscribe to our YouTube channel. So far, Design United has completed 11 installments of Design Conversation, and we have many more exciting speakers lined up with designers across the spectrum joining us to share their thoughts. Next week, we have a new, uh, a new segment of Design United called Design Practice, where we will be joined by architect Min V from Kuching and uh, architect Nisha Matthew Ghosh from Bangalore, who will share their expertise about the design field. Uh, so we make so make sure you guys join us next Saturday at the same time. Design United as a platform is uh, constantly looking for people who are extremely excited and uh, interested in design. And if you want to join the community and help us, we are looking for volunteers for Design United uh, who will be willing to work on the editorial as well as the graphics team. Uh, so please connect with us. 
at our email id at designunited in uh, dot in at the rate gmail dot com and follow us on designunited underscore in on Instagram for further updates. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.